the Women's Lunch Place is pleased to announce Dr. Carolyn Crockett as the WLP's 2020 Spaghetti Dinner Honoree. Dr. Carolyn Crockett was named the City of Boston's first Chief of Equity, a cabinet level position Mayor Walsh established to embed equity and racial justice into all city planning, operations and work moving forward. Under Dr. Crockett's leadership, the Office of Equity is charged with leading the administration's efforts across departments to embed equity into all city work and actively work to dismantle racism by putting an intentional focus on supporting communities of color and marginalized groups across all city departments. Tonight, Women's Lunch Place is honoring Dr. Carolyn Crockett and looking forward to the impact she will have for the community and the population WLP serves. Welcome, Dr. Crockett. Callie, thank you so much. It, it, is, it is an honor to be here with everyone this evening, and it is a special delight to be welcomed and, uh, and, and embraced by you. I'm a big Cali fan from way Thank back you. when, so just to have an evening with you is, is, is a delight. Um, I am so honored by this, this award. really want to thank Jennifer uh, and Kay and the board and you, Cali, for hosting and having us, uh, to Michelle and Casey uh, for co-hosting uh, this event, for the incredible Women's Lunch Place staff. Um, it's, it's just an honor and a delight. And, and in fact, when I got the call about this, I said, I've only been in this role five minutes. How do I get to win any kind of honor? So it is particularly humbling. And, and I, I see it as a call to action. So thank you so much for, for just having me. And I'm so excited for the conversation. Chief of Equity, you know, how do you get there? What has been your path before? The mayor mentioned that you had done some work uh, in City Hall before. But prior to that, what was the journey to this position? Absolutely. It's been it's been a heck of a journey. I feel like I'm just getting started, but you know, I, I'm a homegrown local girl I'm from Boston, born and raised in Dorchester. This is home. Um, my family came to Boston in the in the 50s and 60s. Uh, so another black migrant family from the South, from West Virginia, in fact. And so for now, three and four generations, uh, seems like we have been just trying to figure out how to make the city work um, with mixed results. And so a lot of my experience growing up in the city has been hearing about this place called Boston, sometimes hearing about it from other people who would come into the city to work, uh, to go to school. But as a neighborhood kid, so much of what the city was known for and is celebrated about, I, I just didn't know it. You know, I knew my neighborhood, I knew my block, I knew my family and feel very connected there. But a lot of my experience growing up in the city is kind of that unfortunate tale of the disconnect. And so, so much of my, my career, uh, even my study in college, leaving college, coming back home as a 20 nothing year old person, started a nonprofit working in neighborhoods with high school students so we could learn about uh, the, the city's story, the stories of, of resistance and organizing, uh, particularly by black and brown uh, communities, communities of color that have worked so hard to, to make the city live up to its promise and in fact, to redirect its course. So a lot of my work um, has really informed this the desire to call the city in to itself for mm -hmm. young people and their families. Uh, and so that's really been the journey. And it's been really surprising to find myself in City Hall the first time in, in 2014 and then back now, but uh, a real special oh. privilege and a delight. So I think it would be important because the, the one of the chief responsibilities of your office is sort of root out systemic racism where it is. But, but first define systemic racism because I think we, the word is tossed around. Yeah. And so, how, so after you define it, then how do you begin to get your arms around it? Absolutely. You, you know, Kelly, you're so exactly right for saying kind of, let, let's say what we're talking about. Uh, and, and when the mayor called out uh, racism as a public health crisis and emergency in June, it, it really uh, does the work of elevating the conversation to know that the mayor of Boston is going to put into not only words, but into practice and policy, what it means to identify racism and attack it. But for me, what we're talking about is, is an, a, a logic, a sort of an organization, sort of saying that racism is a way that we have decided and agreed that society can be organized based on a racial hierarchy. Uh, this 
so-called white population or white race, the creation of this idea in people, sort of sitting at the top of this pyramid. And then everyone else uh, organized in descending order all the way down. And so saying that this is the way that we would organize our institutions, our, our laws, our, our spaces, uh, this is a toxin, uh, a disease that has to be rooted out that has contaminated all of our all of our systems. Um, and so the work for me in terms of rooting that out in, in City Hall is to start by calling, calling it out and really saying that the mayor's uh, proclamation of racism as a public health crisis is a real thing to take seriously, not just for City Hall, but for institutions across the city. And so a lot of my work is rolling up my sleeves and getting under the hood of the city's 50, 50 plus departments and agencies, uh, all of the leadership, all of the chief's department heads and it's 18,000 plus uh, uh, talent pool. So there's real work to be done there, but how dare we try to call anyone else out before we recognize that we have been an, an agent of this toxin ourselves. You said in a recent interview that it is unconscionable to know that be, because of your race, your zip code, your job, your housing, your healthcare, you may not have equal opportunities. Uh, elaborate on that. Right, you know, uh, Congresswoman Ayanna Presley has sort of called this, this point out and brought it into attention over and over. So we're, we're fortunate for such powerful representation uh, locally and nationally uh, to say to us, well, how, how could it be that because of, of your race or your ethnicity or money in the bank, or just where you were born, that there can be such a large discrepancy by neighborhood and by zip code. And so we know that this is not only a problem, but again, uh, how dare we in one of the wealthiest cities in, uh, in the wealthiest country in the world, allow these kind of discrepancies to, to determine uh, not only someone's life cycle or lifespan, but the quality of their lives. And so at heart, equity is about calling out a corrective, saying that it should not be, we should not be able to predict the, the, the quality or length of someone's life by these factors, uh, by these things that are a part of our birth. Uh, and our birthright is actually to be able to live in the fullness there. So this is not work for the city, for a city government or agency to be thinking about alone, but absolutely must begin by calling out uh, the leadership of our city uh, by calling the mayor uh, into saying who else is with us on this. And so that's the beginning of the work, but it absolutely has to start by calling it out and making the definitions clear. So it, it's great, Kelly. You know, I really appreciate the way that you have really centered our focus on uh, the power of the Women's Lunch Place. And I know personally just how important it is to have institutions that not, not only stand in the gap in good times, but in hard times. And you really find out, you know, who your, who your allies are, who are, you, who are, who's your support system. We've learned so much in the city just sort of dealing with you know, as you call out these multiple pandemics and without institutions um, and organizations that stand on the front line and the powerful what staff you, that makes a difference, uh, I, I, I'd be terrified to think about where we would be as a city. So just, you know, so much admiration and respect for WLP, it's just not even funny. Are there other chief of equity persons in other cities? Mm -hmm. There are, you know, it's a, it's, a, it's a relatively kind of a new position. I mean, this is the first time that Boston has a chief of equity, but there are about just over a dozen cities or so around the country where you have these chiefs and they are, um, they come in all kinds of varieties in terms of uh, whether or not it's a separate department, whether it's in a, uh, in a, in a cabinet like I am, but what it, 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 it typically is, is you have a progressive mayor um, in a bunch of cities, including um, in Chicago, um, in Atlanta, uh, in LA, where a mayor is deciding to, to make a, a real statement around a value, a value of, of equity, obviously and inclusion, and thinking about how that can be part of, of a government structure. So it's delightful to actually be not only in the, in the role, but to be in conversation with other chiefs around the country, and I have been. So really important to, to kind of think about how to not only call out a value, but to make sure it's centered in terms of the organizational function of a place like a city hall. I was asking about uh, uh, seeing the systemic uh, racism and inequities in sort of the everyday work of the women's lunch place. Uh, I wonder if you could talk about that. 
Yeah, sure. I mean, we have, you know, in our, in our guest um, community, we have 60% of our women who are homeless. We have 64% of our women who are um, from minority communities. And it just plays out all the um, lack of access they've had over the years to a good education, to nutritious resources that are nearby, to um, good wage jobs, transportation. It's just one thing on top of another. Um, and so, you know, we, we welcome everybody here um, and we try to provide the basic services that guests need so that they can get on a pathway to making um, better decisions in their lives. But certainly we recognize that, you know, um, in many ways, you know, the but for the grace of God go I, right? I mean, it is, it is um, communities that have been just systematically under-resourced for years. And that's the condition that our guests are up against. And that said, they're amazingly resilient and they work really hard. And, um, you know, we're just so, so proud when we have successes. And we also know that a lot of our guests will need supports because homelessness is, um, it's a health issue. And when you are dealing with, with being homeless um, or living in poverty, you are more at risk for illnesses like chronic heart disease and diabetes and asthma and, you know, the list goes on. So, um, having, I think, what we're going through right now with COVID and seeing the, the impact on our minority communities, they have not had the access to healthcare that other communities have. And they need, we need, and I, I hope through the, the work that uh, Dr. Crockett's doing and that we are doing with other agencies in the city that we finally and firmly address those lack of access and those social determinants of health. Mm -hmm. Dr. Crockett, what are your specific top priorities and, and how will you measure success? Sure, um, big priorities for me coming out the gate and uh, um, in addition to embedding equity into the city's uh, policies and plans uh, and work is to really bring a particular, a focus, particular focus to the racial wealth gap and uh, just even uh, uh, offering a follow-up to the Federal Reserve Bank's uh, 2015 Color of Wealth report, which many of us recall, though it was five years ago, in many ways feels like just yesterday. And so some of those uh, terrifying data points that came out and can still be uh, quoted, that $247,000 is the median wealth for a white family versus $8 uh, as the median wealth for a black family, not to be confused with $80 or 800, but $8. Um, th there's something not only pernicious about those, those numbers, but enduring. And I, I, I'm, I'm worried, I'm and horrified to even think about what those numbers might look like in this moment of pandemic. And so um, really calling into uh, and to focus what it means to follow up on our understanding of what it means to close the wealth, racial wealth gap, but also to, to really call out very specific solutions there. So um, a focal point for me, uh, in addition, uh, the digital divide. And so we, we've learned a lot in this moment of, of this public health crisis of COVID, of, of seeing what it means for people to be able to have uh, access to the internet at home, um, to have the hardware needed to, to stay connected and also the, the literacy, the digital literacy to be able to navigate. And so um, and in this moment that we're in, this is still a life or death issue for many folks and I've seen it in my own family. And so uh, there's some short term work here immediately in terms of thinking about how to get folks connected, how to get people the information that they need, but also what can we do to, to really set up folks for a longer term uh, recovery that's equitable. Um, the racial wealth gap is a piece of that work, but I can speak for myself in terms of what it means to build equity across generations. This is a struggle that my own family and many other families across the city are still trying to figure out. And I think the government has a role to play uh, for sure. So Jennifer, back to you. Um, what steps is the Women's Lunch Place uh, trying to put in place to achieve what we all would hope for, which is sort of an anti-racist Boston? Yeah, yeah. I'm thinking to one of the points that Carolyn just said around technology. And one of the first things we did when um, COVID hit was to do a tech survey of our guests to see what they needed to stay in community. We consider ourselves a community of women and it's very difficult when you don't have access to Wi-Fi or you don't have a, you know, a tablet. Um, telehealth becoming so important to make sure our guests could stay in touch with their 
their medical service providers. Um, so we, we now see that as a really important engagement for us in terms of making sure that our guests um, have the technology they need. There is research that shows that homeless um, individuals, about 95% have a cell phone and have texting ability. So it's really important that we start to engage in how we can be in communication. You know, we all know we got our first snow of the season. So it's, it's oh. the, you know, a pandemic obviously is, um, you know, over the top, but it, it can be things like an illness or, a, or an act of nature or something that keeps people out of their normal communities. And we need to, we need to address that. So that's something we're taking really seriously at Women's Lunch Place as well. Carolyn, buy-in. These are, this is a tough subject. These are tough subjects. And, you know, your, your task is, is formidable. <laughs> so how do you begin to get buy-in, which is exactly what's happening here with the Women's Lunch Place, um, getting buy-in from people who are supporting and, and donating uh, to, to tonight's effort, so to support the population that they serve. Right. So I wonder, in the overarching plan that you have to build equity into the city, you know, how are you working toward building um, buy-in? Sure. Um, you know, unfortunately, uh, for for me and for all of us, the, the murder of, of George Floyd has caused a, a sort of a centering and a, a, a sort of a growing consciousness about the need to do more. I mean, by watching the murder of, of an unarmed Black man by the, the hands of the state um, in our face, it, it, it seemed like all of the witnessing of that is causing uh, the this a greater reckoning moment. And so when you talk about the idea of buy-in, uh, Callie, it seems like uh, folks are really primed. And if my inbox, and I know I'm not alone, or my cell phone, or any of this is any indication of kind of the, the fervent fervent nature of this moment, um, it, it's calling people are, are looking for a change. And so I think about people who are looking for change, who are on the street and organizing. I think about the Black Lives Matter movement 2020 and beyond. And I think about all of the, the corporate leaders, the folks who are in the education world and the healthcare world who are reaching out to me and others saying, what more can we do? And so it feels like the buy-in um, is, is more of, a, of an expanded consciousness. And we've had these moments before. So I'm not naive to think that this is new, but what I do understand is that the, my role requires for me to call folks not only into consciousness, but to call people into commitment. And so that is um, the difference and the desire for me to coordinate, to connect, and to make sure that these asks turn in these uh, these feelings turn into a commitment, whether it's policy or investments or organizational alignment. Um, and that that is the true work of, of trying to see how we can make this thing uh, sustainable and make a difference in terms of what that emotion is calling us uh, to, calling us into. So Jennifer, um, the Women's Lunch Place is articulating its commitment to the vulnerable, po vulnerable population of these women. Um, and yet uh, you are really enjoying a good strong partnership between uh, the WLP and the city of Boston. And how do you see that continuing, strengthening? How does it work? I'm, I'm very positive that it will continue to deepen. Um, I'm, one of, the, one of the most positive things to come out of this um, pandemic is that our networking and our relationship with the city has strengthened and it's strengthened, strengthened with other agencies that are providing services to vulnerable women. Um, I really applaud the administration for the COVID housing initiative for this winter to de-densify the shelters and house more women. And that has really given us, it's put us at the table to talk to other agencies that are also serving our women. And we are starting to collaborate more and that, that's going to be such a good thing for, for our guests. And the other thing that has come out of this um, that I really applaud Carolyn for her work and I, I know she feels like she hasn't been in it that long, but as, as, a, um, as a group, we are forming a uh, racial equity statement that we will, that we will live, live into. And we're looking at not just um, racial equity for our guests and the services we provide, but us as nonprofits as well. And what are we doing to, to close the, the racial gap that exists across the city and nonprofits? So I think it's really important that it's been called out. And I think a lot of people are engaged and um, really wanting to continue this work together, not, not as separate little silo entities, but together 
as one force facing this, um, this issue. And I know that we are bringing the voice of our women to the table. So many of our women, you know, they're not in the uh, point in time homeless counts because they're unobserved. And that's oftentimes purposeful. They don't want to be observed. And so what do we do with these women that, um, that you know, sort of oftentimes fall through, through the cracks? How can we come together to support them? So I'm really um, very much looking forward to furthering um, the relationship with the city and throughout the city. And Jennifer, I hope that you would count me as an ally and a fangirl in your number. And please let me continue to be a support and, 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 and figure out ways that we can continue to work together and make that collaboration even stronger. Thank you so much, Carolyn. I'm looking forward to it. Um, Carolyn, speaking of that, you made a visit to the Women's Lunch Place. What struck you about it? I did, Callie. Um, and in fact, I had to go back a couple times because when I visited, I enjoyed myself so much that I left my glasses there. So you can see their <laughs> glasses have been restored to my face, but it allowed me an opportunity to come by uh, without being kind of the fancy government bureaucrat that the staff was all saying hi to and smiling. I got to just see folks a little bit just in their natural element and, and it was wonderful. The thing that you cannot help but be struck by is how warm and welcoming the, the place is, the team is, and how it just makes you feel like a whole person. And I felt that just, you know, looking for my glasses. <laughs> and <laughs> that is the work to remind women uh, that they are, that they are whole, that they are valuable, that they are powerful, uh, whether or not they are housed or, or not, whether or not they're employed or not, no matter who you are and where you are, what your station in life, mm -hmm. this is a place where you can come and be called into wholeness and to be received in a way that puts you on the path to, um, to fullness. Mm -hmm into integration and to reconnecting reconnections with all your dreams and hopes for yourself and, and your family and your partners. Um, and I cannot think of any better work than that, any more important work. And uh, I just can speak personally to kind of what that place has meant for me. And again, members of my family who have actually had the pleasure of being blessed by the staff and, and being in hard times and finding WLP a place to begin to put it back together. So um, I come with a, a particular feeling of appreciation, but also gratitude and that, that's the truth. How to deal with the poor white population which may resort to racism to deal with their own insecurity. You know, this is something that we as a city have to really figure out how to talk to people about what it means to be um, one city that uh, where it doesn't matter, you know, what you have or what you don't have. There's something to be said about uh, the power of co cohabitation. And um, in the broadest sense, and you don't get a pass because things have been difficult. In fact, we are a city with when things have been difficult for people of color, for white people, we have figured out a way to pull it together. Um, and that has been not only uh, sort of uh, talk, but it's been truth. I think very specifically about the res Boston resident jobs policy, uh, a, a local hire policy that has made this, that has brought the city into national distinction and what that meant for, uh, for workers, uh, workers of color, black workers and white workers, many of them uh, who had been unemployed coming together to make their way to see that they were connected and united and needed to make an appeal to the construction industry, to developers and GCs to say, recognize us because we deserve to be in conversation about how to create economic opportunity for everyone. And so I can go on and on with stories like that, but until we, with stories like that, but until we think about a reframe in terms of how we are connected based on what we need and what we can create together for the city, instead of relying on a very, very divisive uh, sense of separation, um, we, we have nowhere to go. So we have many examples to call from in our own history that, that show that to be true. Uh, we have to remind ourselves then that, and, and people don't get a pass because it seems like things are difficult or you want to blame someone. Washington has shown us the futility of that kind of approach and we have to do better. Okay. Jennifer, are you seeing an increased need due to COVID? I know many of the WLP guests were not employed, but are you seeing new women fall into homelessness? We are. Um, we are. The, the need is um, intensifying. Um, we know that the uh, level of food insecurity 
uh, initially quadrupled. We know um, studies say that one in eight individuals in Eastern Massachusetts will be experiencing food insecurity. That's a 59% increase from the last count. So that's that's a very big, um, very big gap. And we know that with the um, the ending of the um, moratorium on eviction, that we are already seeing many more women come in our door. We have begun a new um, multifunction uh, housing uh, workshop in which we're trying to quickly move through the barriers that prevent women from getting housing. And every week they have new, new guests and um, many of them homeless that, the, that our advocates are working with. So the numbers are somewhat staggering um, and we are building as much capacity as possible uh, with our staff. And, I just have to say, uh, you know, Carolyn alluded to it, but the staff has been amazing. They've been on the front line and our work is relational. It's not transactional. And that's an investment. You invest in the people um, that are on, on our staff. And that, um, you know, that's one of the reasons we're here tonight to, to raise money is because that is um, not an inexpensive way to do business, but it is the most effective way. And we see outcomes. We house homeless women every week. I mean, we, the work that we're doing is um, very impactful. And we started a new housing stabilization program to make sure that our guests stay housed. It's, it's such a um, difficult situation to see women fall in and out of housing. And so it's important that we invest to do the work to keep women housed as well.